We love supporting and promoting the creators of musical theater throughout the world. And we would love to have your support as well. Go to musicaltheaterradio.com and click on the Become a Patron button because a supportive community is a strong community. Welcome back to another episode of Be Our Guest here on Musical Theater Radio. I am your host, as always, Jean-Paul Yovanoff. One of the shows we feature on the radio station and on the sampler platter is Gideon and the Blundersnorp. And there is a ton of exciting news coming out about the show, so we just had to have someone on to talk about it today. And luckily... We've got two people to come on and talk about the show. So let's welcome Michael Gordon Shapiro and Amy Reed. Michael, Amy, hello. Howdy. Hello. Awesome. Awesome. So we always get to know our guests before we delve into the important stuff. So Amy, who is Amy Reed in 30 seconds? The 30 second bio of Amy. Okay, so I run a little youth theater in Toledo, Ohio called the Children's Theater Workshop, and I am the executive artistic director of the Children's Theater Workshop. I oversee like nine youth theater productions and our professional touring production. I direct with the kids, I stage manage, and I help the kids write their own plays. So we basically work with the kids in any way from three-year-olds to 18-year-olds, and then our professional adult staff and I get to do a little bit of everything from working with the children to fixing the toilets. It's a glamorous gig, y'all. <laughs> oh, the life in theater, isn't it? Wonderful. <laughs> you have to know, be able to do a little bit of everything, don't you? A little bit of everything, yes. Nice. So, Michael, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm going to give you 27 seconds because we have met you. but Right, uh, I've been on the show before. Us. Yeah, Mike. I should be more efficient in giving my bio at this point. Exactly. Uh, well, let's see. I started my career writing music for film and TV and games, instrumental underscore, uh, kind of coming from an orchestral film scoring background. And somewhere along the line, my childhood love of musical theater decided that it could not be denied. And I started seriously uh, taking seriously the, the goal of writing for theater. So I've been writing shows primarily for young or family audiences of which uh, Gideon and the Blunderstorm is the, the most recent one. Fantastic. How did I do? <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. It was 27 seconds exactly, I think. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Um, so I mentioned at the top of the show, we got lots of exciting news. Michael, tell us what this exciting news is. Well, I thought what I'd do is do a really quick just overview of what the show is sure. for the you know the few people in the world who who don't know already, right? <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll try to keep this brief. But Gideon and the Blunder Snorp is a family musical. Um, it bills itself as an adventure musical, so it's set in a kind of quasi medieval uh, sword and, and monster kind of world. And it's about a, a young stable hand and a viscountess, uh, a minor member of the nobility. I should clarify, that's two different people. And they both escape from bandits and they face a giant monster called a Blundersnorp. And uh, the Blundersnorp has been roaming the forest and overturning merchant carts and otherwise acting antisocial. And uh, the two of them have an adventure. And during the process of the adventure, they come to question the roles that society has set aside from them. So Gideon, the stable hand, has always been told, you know, you're always going to be a, a laborer at the stables. You, you shouldn't even think of being more. He would love to be a essentially a knight, which in this world is called a cavalier. And on the flip side, uh, Alana, the Viscountess, uh, has been told that her self-worth comes from the fact that she's part of the nobility, the aristocracy, and that her life will really begin when she inherits the queendom, when she becomes the, the dynastic ruler of her kingdom. And thus her life is spent waiting for eight cousins to die, which is when she will ascend the throne. So you have two people who both have been told that they have specific destinies as set out by society. And during the course of the adventure, they come to question that. And um, the, there's, there's essentially a good message of self-determination that has been smuggled in amidst all the entertainment. So that's the question you, that's the answer to the question you didn't ask. Yes. Now you have to remind me what the question you asked was, because well, that was like two minutes ago. What's the exciting news? <laughs> All right. So there's quite a bit going on. Um, 
when we last spoke, we had just done a Zoom version of this show, a, a Zoomsical. And this, like many other productions of that kind, was the result of the pandemic. We had planned a 2020 premiere at the Hollywood Fringe Festival, and pandemic happened. The Hollywood Fringe Festival ceased to happen, and several productions, ours among them, went scrambling for a way to do it online. And that was a really cool experience. Um, we had a lot of, we had a couple of uh, legit Broadway actors join the cast because they didn't have a lot else to do at the moment. And they were really excited to do musical theater. Uh, we had a, an amazing editor who created a kind of cinematic flow for the visuals. And it, it just came out way better than it had any right to. And it was fun. Mm -hmm. uh, that was 2020. But uh, as the pandemic well, I don't want to say lifted, but there was kind of a brief window kind of after the first strain was dying down, but before Delta had really kicked in. So summer of 2021, and we said, we can, let's do a real stage version. And so we brought the show on stage for the first time to the uh, aforementioned Hollywood Fringe Festival. And our timing was perfect. We managed to do it just before the, the Delta variant came in and kind of threw another monkey wrench in the global performing arts scene. And we had a really wonderful production. Uh, the, the, the audience members were very patient and they wore masks. Fortunately, the cast did not have to. So we, we had that basic level of visualization of the cast members. Uh, we won the award for best musical. <clears throat> we won the Encore Producers Award. We had a couple of other honoraria, but it was just a, a wonderful experience to be coming back to theater and that uh, got the show off to a a great, I guess not start, but second phase and first stage premiere. Uh, subsequent to then, uh, much excitement has continued to be under uh, be afoot. We released uh, just two days ago the cast album of the aforementioned LA production, which uh, came out well, mostly because I decided to use a professional mixing engineer and supposed to mixing it myself, so it sounds lovely and polished, and you can hear everybody. And uh, fast forwarding to the present, we uh, we have Amy's production coming up in the summer. And I guess I should let Amy talk about that because you've heard my voice for way too long at this point. <laughs> so Amy, tell us a little bit how you discovered the show and, and a little bit about that. So I didn't actually discover the show. Mike and I have sort of stayed in touch for almost 10 years now yeah. because I used to work for Bowling Green State University as a children's mm -hmm. theater professor and I did his other musical one of his other musicals Super Sidekick mm -hmm. and I adored it and I continue to to wax eloquent about how much I enjoyed that show and so Mike and I have sort of stayed in touch every once in a while every couple of years and so when he messaged me about getting in the blunder snorp the answer was, I don't know how, but yes. <laughs> so I um, have been leveraging some relationships here in the city of Toledo to try and continue the work that we're doing here at the Children's Theater Workshop for pre-professional development for young performers. And I was said, you know, we have this fantastic new musical that's being offered to us. We could possibly get that going. And so the city of Toledo and I are working together to actually fund this apprenticeship young people work study along with some of our adult professional performers and these eight performers are working together to present Gideon and the Blundersnorp this summer. So it's a lot of things that I'm excited about kind of all coming together. Uh, you, Mike can tell you that he and I corresponded a lot in the last six months of, is it ready yet? I don't know, hold on, I'm waiting for someone else to say yes. Is it ready yet? Hold on, I need someone else to say yes. And so finally everybody said yes. And now the cast is, is working on it and they're in rehearsals and they are just constantly giggling and sending me silly photos of the rehearsal process, it's fun. That's fantastic. Now let's pretend Michael can't hear us, but what do you really love about the show? What 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 is it that, because we don't want him to get too much of an ego, right? But we'll pretend <laughs> he's not listening. Well, what, what draws you to the show? What, what makes it so much fun? I mean, you're going to ask me this, and I hate that I, I'm worried that my answer is a bit pedantic. So, <laughs> so as a children's theater professional, one thing that I really like about this show is that the humor is scaffolded. It's not just layered, mm -hmm. but like 
if a preschooler came and saw this show, they would love it for the beautiful young lady and the dashing young man and the silly characters and the falling and the singing and the fighting. And that's just one scaffold level of, of humor and entertainment. But then like my, my 10 to 12 year olds would understand some jokes that were really specifically for their age range and their developmental level. And so they would enjoy it for something entirely different. And then the adults that come and see the show with their kids or uh, the grandparents that come and see the show with their adult children, there's levels of understanding of music musical theater humor and storytelling humor and other kinds of jokes that are really only cognitively for someone who's an adult. And so it's, it's the kind of humor that it's really got something for everyone. And so I think Mike's correct in saying it's family theater, mm -hmm. you know, and good theater for children is just playing good theater. And I think that Mike understands that in a way a lot of musicians and composers and playwrights don't really understand. Nice. You can turn your uh, mic, your speakers back up, Michael. Now, <laughs> I was what just, I said, uh, Mike, in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah, now that you're back, all I basically said was, "It's kind of cool." <laughs> okay, good, good, good. Uh, I mean, I could have said that really, but if you wanted to talk to her, that that's fine. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, since uh, the the Fringe Festival and the 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 production that's happening with Amy, Michael, um, has it changed? Was it, did you do any work on it, or is it kind of the the same show that came from the digital to the Fringe to to here? Uh, between the live fringe version and the version that Amy has, I think I tweaked one or two lines of dialogue. Mm -hmm. uh, without getting spoilery, there was a, a final bit of dialogue with Alana, the Viscountess, that told us a little bit about her future, where she was going. And uh, there was an original version that was a little talkier and less exciting. And strangely, I was able to tweak it so that she seems much more heroic and bold. She's, you know, we get a more confident sense that she is off to a really fun future. And so I tweaked that as a result of seeing the, the stage premiere. There was more meaningful change between the original Zoom version and the stage premiere because I had a couple of months to really look at the piece and uh, do a little bit of you know, dramaturgical soul searching and... What was cool about that Zoom version is it ended up being essentially a workshop. It was a beta test and it let me see where I needed to change things and improve things and simplify things. So the, the version we did last summer and the version that's being done this summer is refined and I think in better shape than it would have been had we not done the Zoom version. So I, I say that the pandemic was sort of a, a blessing in disguise in, in the very narrow sense of giving me more chance to uh, develop this show. Yeah, the, the pandemic is obviously a terrible thing, but what we were able to take out of it and what we were able to grow out of it, I think, um, like your show and just all the things we've learned, it, it, it made such a difference. And I don't think we would have reached any of these points if we hadn't had that time. Um, unfortunately, off to do these things. So congratulations on on getting it up on the Zoom in the first place and then where you've been able to take it in, in the, the time that you've had. So, Michael, that's, that's fantastic. Well, thank you. You know, when I wasn't listening to Amy, um, she made a good point, which was um, the what I've tried to do with my shows is take pity on the parents, uh, mm -hmm. knowing that somebody has to bring the kids <laughs> to the theater. Uh, I really write something that's, not, I, I don't I don't call it TYA theater. Um, I really call it family for a reason. I'm, I'm shooting for the the Pixar vibe of offering something to some to everybody. And if kids occasionally hear a word they don't understand and they ask their parents about it afterwards, maybe I've you know that's that's a good thing. That's I don't feel guilty about making a kid grab for a dictionary or nag their parents because I use some thirty cent word you know or something like that. Uh, 42 cents Canadian. Yeah, I think so. And uh, does anybody own a dictionary anymore? I'm trying to think. I'm looking at my shelf now and I don't even know if I have a physical dictionary anywhere. Dictionary.com and uh, yes. is surprisingly useful if you're a lyricist along with <laughs> thesaurus.com. Yes. So I'm giving those services free advertising right here. <laughs> Amy, tell us a little bit about the production itself and, and some of the, the actors and the process that uh, you've had since you got the show. Sure. So we've actually had a couple of weeks of rehearsal. Um, and one of the things that I mentioned previously, so we've got a, a group of half the uh, actors are like 17, 18 year olds 
you know, high school or just graduated high school. And the other half are in their 20s and 30s and they're more established performers and hardly any of them know each other. Mm. And it's interesting because the way, you know, Michael writes is you really do need a, a sense of camaraderie and ensemble in order to make the humor and those nuances work. And so they've really spent the first couple of days just singing together and starting to get the jokes. And I think at one point, the director said they were cursing Michael for some of the accidentals <laughs> in the <laughs> in the libretto. And I told them that they, uh, I would, I would speak to him about that. And, and I'm sure he would give that all the consideration it deserved. But they are just so silly. And I think that Michael is shamelessly encouraging that in the script because the way that the humor and the, there's action, 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 and then somebody does something ridiculous and somebody interrupts the, the flow because of a, a misplaced word or a misunderstanding or some kind of silliness. And the, the actors are just really latching on to that and finding ways to just kind of add that, add their own sense of humor to Mike's and like just kind of building upon it. And I think that's kind of fun with the script that you you do have all these opportunities to be interrupted. That's actually one of the things I really like about his style and his flow is that he's got this beautiful music and this music, beautiful lyrics, and he's not afraid to interrupt himself. And for the joke, for the humor, for the miscommunication, I, I love in Gideon and the Blundershorp specifically, there's so many characters who are drastically unqualified for their work or and I, I just I hate to say but I really relate to that it's like I'm an intelligent <laughs> individual but I do not know what I'm doing right now and that's something that the actors are really having fun with as well and so like you know I, I the director sent me a photo last night of the actors just posing dramatically with props they happen to find in the building that are not their props. They're not rehearsal props, but some of them, one of them picked up like a pool noodle and was like, this is my sword now. And like, you could wait for a sword prop if you wanted to. They're like, no, this is now my, my prop sword. It is a pool noodle and we are not changing anything. Thank you. Like, well, you know, when we do the show, you are gonna have to use a prop sword. They're like, mm, we can talk about that. <laughs> so they're, they're just, they're really latching onto the humor. They're really having a lot of fun. I think that they're, they're, bonding very quickly over the the absurdities that are just really inherent in the story and in the script. Nice. I'll, like, I'll you, give you a, a I'm sorry, didn't mean to- No, go on, go on. I was gonna give a concrete example of maybe what Amy's talking about in, in abstract. Uh, there's one line where the where a bandit chief is trying to get our heroes to quit trying to escape and he sings, um, slightly paraphrased, give up that for which you fought, you know you really ought and he realizes that he's he needs to add another word because the sentence isn't done. So he sings to a sort of like this awkward afterthought. I, I love having villains screw up their lyrics yeah. in, in a way that shows that they're not really on top of their game somehow. They're, they're always like, uh, I, had, I had another show where a, a villain is giving this like stern, um, angry musical of condemnation and he realizes his grammar is wrong and he stumbles and he's like, wait, no, that's not it. Never mind. And then he goes on. So it's it's one way to make it to sort of defang a villain so that they, you know they don't freak out the the youngest kids and also let the adults kind of uh, laugh at the fact that lyrics are reflective of of villainy in some way. Very nice. Are you going to get a chance to get out there to see it? I'd like to. I, I mean, I haven't technically been invited. <laughs> wow. Toledo mind. is Toledo is an open border city. You can come in if you'd like. Phew, okay. Well, I didn't want to, yeah, I always, I always dream of like showing up at these things in secret, you know, and I'm just like, no, I actually, I, I told, I told the cast that I was going to try and talk to like our local arts commission um, to see if they'd be willing to help me bring some people in. Um, and so we'll see, we'll see what we can make happen. But the actors like immediately froze up because again, they were just being very silly. And then I was like, Hey guys, this, uh, this thing might happen where, you know, the person who wrote this, you know, I might ask see if I can get him to show up. And they immediately went, oh, no, but we're big doofuses. <laughs> and I was like, yes, I know. I think he'd like to see that. <laughs> and they will be judged accordingly. Nice. Better, oh, yes. Better be doofusy. I mean, I, I expect <laughs> to see some some high top shelf doofusness going on. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, in the Children's Theater Workshop, like I said, the kids help write their own plays as well. And so they... They, uh, my, my 10 to 12 year olds collaboratively wrote a play and they have this similarly goofy sense of humor 
where like they named a character top secret who works for the government. And so everyone's like, what's your name? And she's like, it's top secret. And they're like, you can tell me, no, really. She's like, I did, it's top secret. And they're like, fine, <laughs> don't tell me. And that's the kind of humor that Michael puts in his script. So even like my 13 year olds who are totally too cool for a kid's musical, uh, are like, ah, this is really funny. Can I come see it? Or can I help work in tech or something like that? So it's it's really charming. It really, it completely suits the, the humor of how we do things around here. That's awesome. That's awesome. Michael, I'd love to talk a little bit about uh, the cast recording and, and how that went and, you know, the availability and things like that. So what can you tell us about the cast recording? One thing I learned when making the cast recording of my prior show, The Bully Problem, is you really want to do your vocal tracking right after the show, mm -hmm. uh, when everyone's got the music fresh in their heads. And so I, I kind of reserved a date that I could just usher everyone into the studio. Uh, Gideon has a cast of, depending on the production, either eight or 10. So you need a, a fairly large room if you want to record everybody at the same time. And, you know, you, you can do things in overdubs, but for group numbers, uh, like the opening number, the, the banded song, the forest chase song, it's really nice to have everyone in the same room and playing off each other. Uh, so we, we were able to do the, the main vocal tracking in, in uh, Clear Lake Recording Studios here, which has a really nice room uh, with enough space. And uh, this is getting a little technical, but one thing that they can do, which is really nice, is put sufficient separation between the vocalists so that even though they're all singing at the same time, there isn't that much mic spill. So if you think of two people singing into two mics, you know, you get each mm -hmm. mic picks up both singers. You, you don't have magical separation, which means that your mix is a little more limited. And what they did, what I really appreciated was they added just enough separation, you know, like these, these baffles with carpets draped over them and everything. It's actually quite pretty. Um, the loud in the mix to adjust the levels of the of the singers and and mix different takes. So you have singer singer one from take one, singer two from take two, even though theoretically the you know the the, the background of both of those mics is a different take. There's enough separation that you can mix them together. Um, I, I'm probably making your head swim a little bit, but the upshot is that we had a lot of mix control. So the I was able to take like the best performance of every lyric, of every song, of every actor. And I am obsessive in exactly that way. I'll, I'll sit there and listen to every take and say, oh, that one was a little better there. And the word the is better in this take. So I'm gonna mix that with the word end in this take and I kind of uh, cut it all together. But yeah, it was um, done over a period of months. I had uh, the, the singers come into my, my studio to just do pickups. And when I made that one dialogue change that I mentioned, I had them come in re-record that. So um, it was kind of the best of both worlds because we could do our group tracking in one big room. And then I had time to finesse the details. Um, I usually would mix these things myself and I wisely decided to go with a professional this time. Um, a mixer named Matt Brownlee, who's a Grammy winner, and he just did an amazing job. So it uh, sounds great, and it is out on all the major streaming services, including many that I've never heard of. And uh, for anyone who wants to hear the cast album, this is our, our LA premiere from last year, you just go to gideonmusical.com, just one word, and there's links for the album and links for social media and, and all that good stuff. That's fantastic. And and going into the tech part, you've just made all the sound designers so happy and sound people who are listening right now. They're going, he's talking to me. So thank you <laughs> from them. They deserve something every now and then. for the Exactly. Work exactly. Actually, I'm, I'm trying to get a sound designer for, for the West End onto the show because I never talked to anybody like that. And that would, be, I think, be an awesome conversation, but that's a whole different thing. Um, Amy, tell us about the show. When is it going on? How do the people find out about it? Where do they buy tickets and all that fun, important stuff? Yeah, so the exciting thing about our particular iteration of Gideon and the Blender Snorp is that because it's in partnership with the city of Toledo, we are performing it all over Toledo. Oh. So we are actually performing it in the historic Ohio theater where our programs take place, but we're also performing it in the auditoriums in Toledo public libraries. Oh. And we're also trying to work on a scheduling opportunity to perform it in an outdoor amphitheater in one of Toledo's city parks. So this 
program is actually part of uh, the city of Toledo's effort to kind of do a COVID recovery effort to provide opportunities for children and their families to get back into society and be okay and to use the arts to kind of create that sense of togetherness again. So the funding actually brings in not just Gideon the Blundersnorp and the actors, but it also pays for taking it all over the city of Toledo to these different performance opportunities. And so in some cases, people could be absolutely come on over to the Ohio theater and, and sit in a theatrical seat and watch it from there. And in some cases it's, I don't know, are you wandering around in this one park? Well, we got a show going on over here. You might as well, they're kind of loud. So what else are you gonna do, right? <laughs> so it, it's actually, we're still setting all of, most of those in place. We actually just locked in our library dates yesterday in July and we're just figuring out how to get all these performances and like little nooks and crannies all over the city um, so that's going to be fun I think that the performances are all going to be in July and August and um, let's see we are looking at um, I think we're looking at July um, 29th and 30th or 30th and 31st for the ones that are actually in-house. So it's kind of weird. We're, we're still sort of piecing things together with the city. Um, I don't know if you all know this, but working with city government to schedule things is actually a lot more complicated than you might think. What? Oh. Really? Eh. That's not the city governments I know. Yeah. <laughs> right? It's, well, maybe Toledo's an anomaly. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. And we will promote that as soon as you have uh, any set stuff and, and a link. So yeah. We'll promote that on the website and our. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, um, yeah. It's that's part of the, the, the interesting part of the design is the director was like, I need a lot of trees. And then our touring managers like, can the trees fit in a pickup truck? <laughs> and the director's like, um, we need a lot of trees. <laughs> like, OK, well, how many trees can we fit in a library auditorium? And they're like, what library auditorium? I thought we were going at the theater. Well, we are. So it's it's also kind of combining, uh, we're, we're beta testing how well the show tours. Nice. So mm. it's gonna be, we're doing a lot of things all at once. And I think that once we figure out how the puzzle pieces can fall together, it'll be good. Very cool. Well, congratulations to you, Amy, on, on the show and Michael for you writing the show and, and getting it up. That is fantastic. Um, before we go, um, I will have one question. So, and this is for both of you, and you, one of you can answer first. So, Amy, for Michael, who do you think he would fit best in the show if he was performing? Which character would you think he would be? Do you need me to leave again? <laughs> no, Michael, you're going to say the same thing about Amy, so <laughs> this is okay. <laughs> Honestly, so this is this is the funny part. I have never actually met Michael in person. And this is the first time he and I have corresponded, like in terms of audio. Oh, really? So we've never, <laughs> we've never heard each other's voices. And I've still never seen his face because he's not using a camera today. Yeah. So, um, so that being said, because of my very recent experience and only ever heard hearing his voice, I kind of want to hear him play the Blundersnorp. It's, you know, I don't want to like spoil how it gets done, but the, <laughs> the vocals of the Blundersnorp, I think are particularly striking. And I think you need a particularly striking voice to make that navigate well. So I think I'd like to hear him do the Blundersnorp. Nice. And Michael, before you, you say which uh, character Amy is, are you real? Are you an AI? Because I don't think I've seen your face either. Um, so... <laughs> If I'm an AI, I'm I'm really convincing. Yeah, I know so this is incredible. So right, like they they can create now. I know, like That's really fun, interesting stuff. So, <laughs> so who do you think Amy would would be in the show? I almost want to change my answer because she cast me as a monster. But uh, <laughs> the monster's I, the most fun part. Everyone yeah. likes to be monsters, except that one kid who's scared of the monster. Don't cast them there. Okay, good, good save, good save. Well, um, clearly, Amy is incredibly ambitious, and she's doing many things without breaking a sweat. Um, I can see there's no clearly no sweat. So I, I would say she's uh, an Alana type, uh, Alana being the sort of fearless, multi-talented um, co-protagonist of the show. And for all I know, Amy can also ride horseback and fire arrows at the same time. So uh, yeah, I'm getting, I'm getting sense she can. So that, that seems to be the most obvious casting choice. Nice. Nice. Well, yeah. if, we, if we ever do a future show, I know who to cast. So <laughs> we'll yeah, I, I like, I, I was, when I was reading the script, uh, it's like, yeah, I'm, a, I'm definitely a little bit like Alana and my husband's kind of like Gideon. Hmm. 
Hmm. And it's funny because the two of them fight because they are so different and they approach life so differently. Um, Alana kind of has it together and Gideon's like, I don't know, this sounds fun. So um, yeah, I was like, yeah, well, that's what makes them such a dynamic pairing in this, in this show. They, they're very interesting and, and exciting in their own ways. Their journeys are very fascinating and fun. Very cool. Very cool. Again, Amy, Michael, thank you so much for coming on and telling us more about uh, the Blunder Snorp and, and congratulations on, on the production and the cast recording. And I'm excited to see where it goes. And Toledo is less than five hours drive from me. So I just looked it up. And went, mm, That's a promise. It's true. So, Michael, that if you make coming. that short list um, of Amy's, <laughs> who gets invited? <laughs> I'll, Maybe I'll, we can I'll put in a good word for you. Yeah. Thanks. If you drive five hours, I'll buy your ticket. How about that? Thanks. That's very kind of you, sir. <laughs> All right. Again, thank you very much, uh, the two of you, for coming on the show. Thanks for having Thanks us. Thanks for having us. All right. We were just speaking with uh, Michael Gordon Shapiro and Amy Reed, uh, taking care of Gideon and the Blundersorp, the musical, which is going to be in Toledo in uh, July or August. We're We'll let you know, everybody, uh, via our social media when that will be happening. Tune in next week as we'll have another guest or guests uh, talk about their life, love, and passion. That is musical theater. I'm your host, as always, Jean-Paul Yovanoff. And until next time, I'll see you when I see you.